What's going on all my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you're having a wonderful day. We are here to help you pass your NCLEX and nursing school exams like a boss. And today we're continuing on with our lab value series and we're gonna be discussing hematocrit. So to begin with, let's talk about whole blood products. So when we're looking at our complete blood counts or CBCs, this is the general overview of what's in our whole blood products. So our blood is about 55% plasma and 45% formed elements. Our plasma is made up of 91% water, 7% proteins, that includes our albumins, our globulins, fibrinogen, and prothrombin, 2% other solutes, gases, ions, nutrients, regulatory substances, as well as waste products. Our formed elements are our red blood cells, which is usually in the millions, platelets, and our white blood cells, which can be further broken down into neutrophils, eosinophils, lymphocytes, basophils, and monocytes. So what is hematocrit? So hematocrit is defined as the ratio of the volume of blood cells to the total volume of blood as determined by separation of the red blood cells from the plasma, usually by use of a centrifuge. So again, just like our hemoglobin, our normal volumes are going to be gender dependent. So females are gonna have a normal hematocrit of 37 to 47%, and males are gonna have a normal hematocrit of 42 to 52%. So when we look at the pathophysiology of hematocrit, it really follows the same steps as red blood cells, right? So it's generated in the bone marrow and it's the percentage of total packed red blood cells. That's our PRBCs when we're giving blood transfusions. Something else that's important to note is that hem uh, hematocrit helps us identify anemia. So if we have a low hematocrit, we have some kind of anemia taking place, whereas if we have a high hematocrit, we probably have something like dehydration or polycythemia vera taking place. So when we're obtaining hematocrit lab values, the test tube that we're going to use is the Lavender Top Tube with EDTA. Why? Because it has anti-clotting in the tube to keep that blood from clotting. And when we obtain these lab specimens, the technique that we wanna use is we don't want to provide force whenever we're injecting blood into the test tube. Those test tubes have negative pressure inside. So once the needle is inserted into the tube, the blood should automatically rush in. If you are pushing blood into a test tube, it can cause hemolysis, which is a breakdown of blood cells and will decrease the overall hematocrit count and can lead to wrong treatment. So we don't want to be pushing that blood into a test tube. You also want to take into consideration the needle size as well as the tubing. Your needle should be no less than 20 gauge for the best results. You really want to make sure that you have at least an 18 or a 20 gauge when you're obtaining these lab values because it will decrease the potential for hemolysis taking place and decreases our chances of treating hemat hematocrits inappropriately. So looking at abnormal values and causes, we can see that with an elevated hematocrit, it's usually caused by one of three things. It could be inadequate tissue oxygenation, also known as low perfusion of the blood. You see this a lot when it comes to our COPD and pulmonary, and pulmonary fibrosis patients because they have an increased need for oxygen, thus increasing their need for red blood cells, hematocrit, and hemoglobin. When it comes to dehydration, if we have a decrease in our water content of total blood volume causing an increased percentage of that red blood cell and hemoglobin, you're going to see a slight increase in that hematocrit. However, on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you have polycythemia vera, which is bone marrow cancer that is caused um, usually by the bone marrow's production of too many red blood cells, the blood cells become thick, they slow down the flow, and then leads to serious complications such as clotting, you're gonna see a very, very high increase in those red blood cells and hemoglobins, ultimately increasing your hematocrit. So when we're talking about decreased hematocrit, it can be, again, a number of things. We could be looking at anemia, specifically sickle cell anemia, because of the very specific crescent shapes. They inhibit the attachment of oxygen. It inhibits um, red blood cell formation because they don't have that beautiful bioconcave design. So again, it's going to limit our hematocrit numbers. 
kidney disease because of the decrease in erythropoietin production, bone marrow disease or failure such as aplastic anemia where there's a scarring of the bone marrow, blood loss um, usually treated by blood transfusions, and then lastly acute leukemia such as AML. So leukemia cells replace the blood making cells in the bone marrow causing a decrease in production of red blood cells and platelets, thus decreasing your hematocrit numbers. I hope that these videos were helpful for you in passing your NCLEX and nursing school exams like a boss. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you subscribe and turn on that notification bell. That way you're informed every time I post a new video here on Nurse Chung. Make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. And check out my website at www.nursechung.com where I've posted additional resources such as NCLEX style questions to help you pass those exams, resources, cheat sheets, and so much more. Until next time, I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you all again soon. Bye.